on behalf of the senior pastor of the Tunapuna Open Bible Church, Church on the Way, Reverend Dr. Desmond Austin and our members, we welcome you to Pentecost 2022, Building Together, Experience the Reconnect. At this time, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence this evening, because in your presence, there's fullness of joy. And even now, God, we just ask for your Holy Spirit to dwell in every corner of Trinidad and Tobago. We ask you, Spirit of God, to dwell in every home, every heart. Father, there are so many broken hearts out there right now that need to be reconnected with you, reconnected to your presence. And Father God, we declare right now that lives are going to be transformed in this season, dear God. We declare right now that laborers are going to come forth to work in the vineyard, to bring souls back to you, God, to reap a bountiful harvest, oh God. So as we get ready for the worship, may the words of the songs minister to those listening right now in the name of Jesus. And as we get ready for the word after God, may the words from your servant God minister to those who are lost and in need a word they need a reassurance they need a reminder of who you are in their lives dear god father we thank you father we thank you in no other name but jesus christ amen and amen
somebody's soul would I catch a fire, catch a fire, catch a fire, Jesus. I'm with somebody's soul would I catch a fire, find them with the Holy Ghost. Come on. into our lives oh lift those hands as we worship him today hallelujah oh, 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 Lord. Oh, 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 oh we worship you today There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare your all living home. Your presence, Lord. Lift those hands. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence lord 
your praise. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Sing. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our heart longs for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more. Come on, sing. There's nothing worth more, say, that would ever come close. Nothing. You're all living hope, oh God. Oh, your presence, Lord. Anybody taste it and seen the sweetness of love? Come on, say, I've tasted it. Of the sweetest of love, when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit, your presence.
spirit Your glory God yeah Your glory God your glory God your glory God by your sing that one more time from your heart sing Holy Spirit you are Come flood this place and fill me Your glory God give him what he deserves why don't you give him what he deserves today somebody worship holy spirit holy spirit somebody worship the king oh he's worthy somebody cry out come on out of your belly flow out of your belly out of your belly flow worship To fall on me, we say, open the floodgates in abundance and cause your rain to fall on me. Open the floodgates in abundance and cause your rain to fall. Worship her, let it rain, cause your rain, let it fall, somebody say where, where
Matama Haya. No more selfless worship. Deep cries unto deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a powerful time of worship indeed. I don't think they wanted to stop. Nobody really wanted it to stop. But of course, we have to continue, right? So thank you so much to the worship team, to the dancers, the musicians, all who made that worship experience possible as we experience the reconnect. At this time, without further ado, let us welcome to share the word with you as the Spirit of God would have laid upon his heart no other or none other rather than Reverend Dr. Desmond Austin. Building together. Here are the principles. Number one, we read in verse number two, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the twelfth year, that as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hannah and I one of my brethren came with men from Judah, and I asked them, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity. Here is a principle that you must never forget. Never forget you can never, never, never arise above the level of your information. The nation is in disarray. Marriage and family is in disarray. We find that there is abortion, a rampant increase in divorce in marriages. We find that there is economical difficulties, national warfare, nations rising against nation. There are all kinds of issues. But if you have to be involved as a kingdom-minded person, we're building the walls that are broken down in families. We're building the walls that are broken down in marriages. We're building the walls that are broken down in our churches. And the catalog is endless. If you have to arise and build, if we have to build together, you need the necessary information. There is a sense in which the Bible tells us my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You didn't say we are destroyed for sin, which we know is true. But we are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Ignorance is not bliss, and ignorance is not blessed. So we must be aware. We are listening to me today. Without awareness, there cannot be proper focus. So with the information, you will get right direction. Without proper awareness of what is happening, you will be able to do what you must do. We had this message recently preached about two men running with a message. One man with zeal and the other one with knowledge. And the one with zeal was in front. But of course, he reached to the king but he had no tidings ready. We have zeal without knowledge. If we have to have intelligent fires, we must have the zeal, but we must also have the knowledge. Secondly, be aware of your call. When we looked into this passage, when we look into this passage, we recognize that this man of God, he asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Watch this. He concerned himself with the people and he concerned himself with the place. God always calls us to a people and he always calls us to a place. You're not Holy Ghost Junior. God didn't call you everywhere and he didn't call you to everyone. Your calling is always geographically 
and demographically it is always to a place and it's always to a people and if you have to be a builder of kingdom if you have to advance God's kingdom if you will be a part of a team if you work together to advance God's kingdom you have to understand we have to do it together but you have to understand be aware of your call remember this as we look into the account of Nehemiah Nehemiah was so concerned even in the fact that he was in the citadel in other words he was in the palace of the king and he was in his comfort zone but yet he was concerned about what was happening with his brethren he was concerned about what was happening with his people are you concerned about what's happening in the nation today are you concerned about what's happening with the people of this nation we still have a hope today and it's not in government we still have a hope today and it's not in politics we still have a hope today and it's not in church and religion our hope today is in Jesus Christ let's remember we must have a sense of destiny and so this man of God he looked at what was happening and he was burdened in other words what you can tolerate you cannot change if you look on this nation and you can tolerate all that is happening in terms of the ills and the evils of society around the Caribbean and around the world and it doesn't break your heart and it doesn't burden your heart doesn't call you to go and bend the knees then I question your convictions as far as your values are concerned we must be as a people be broken before God when we observe and we become aware by reading by listening by observation of what's happening in the, happening in the nation remember what you can tolerate you cannot change we are called to be change agents and the only reason that Nehemiah was able to bring change is because what was happening around him not like the others who just simply complained but he was willing to do something about what is happening are you willing to do what is necessary to build your part because you're not called to do my part but you have to understand your role in God's goal it must come from the heart it must come from the soul number three we are called to make communities better remember that when Nehemiah heard and you can read the scriptures in the book of Nehemiah repeatedly you hear the call what is the call the call is to rebuild the wall what is the call the call is to repair the gates to build and to repair and so today we are called to make communities better I want you to understand that I like the worship but there's a worship that is belonging to the community as well I want you to know that when we begin to minister to the community they will see our good works and you know what they will do they will glorify our father which is in heaven there's a worship that we must give to the community that is not within the walls of the church it is a worship that brings honor and glory to God when we step into the community and they can see Christ in us when we have Jesus Christ incarnated into the community we must not just talk it we must begin to walk it so we are called to make communities better walls are for separation you see the people were in distress and they were in reproach but there was also the fact if you read the account the Bible said the survivors who are left there in the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach and separately he says the walls of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire and listen as we speak today we are called to build walls when we talk about walls of separation we are not talking about abandonment you know the Bible talks about the fact that we are called to make contact and we are called to communicate why because we are the light of the world we are the salt of the earth and so I hear people say all the time 
And I want you to understand while we talk about walls of separation. Yes, indeed, the Bible says, come out from among them and be separate. But that is not a separation of abandonment. Because you cannot change what you can't touch. We're called to make contact and have communication without contamination. Because salt flavors and light gives direction. And so when we come to the place of building walls, we must understand the separation is not a us and a them, but it's a value, a standard that lets people know that the walls of marriages can be built. In other words, you can have a vision, but without values, your vision are broken down walls. Understand what I mean today. A man wants to be healthy, but he eats the wrong food. He has a good vision, but he lacks discipline. Somebody wants to be healthier, but they don't do the right thing. They have the right vision, but the wrong value. Walls are like values that give meaning to our vision. And if we have to build together, we must not have a vision for change in our communities, but we must have values. Values that say we are not better than them. Values that remind us that we were once sinners and we are now saved by God's grace. Reminding us that we were once a disgrace, but now we are saved, saved by God's grace. The walls of separation that I speak of today, it is not wall of isolation. It is not walls of abandonment, but it's walls that people can see a standard in us. They can see a value in us, a value that attracts so that the distresses in marriages, the distresses in family, the distresses in business. We must raise a standard that people can see. And so when we have walls, even though we talk about separation, it's also walls of protection. We are called, as we are saying today, to separation, not to abandonment. And if we have to be salt and light, if we have to be walls and gates, we must become, as we say, number four, community faith engages. Gates are for access. Gates are for access. Conduct based, in other words, on counselor. Whenever you think about gates in the scriptures, one of the major purposes of gates was places of meeting. It was places where counselor was had, where counselor was held. Jesus said, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It means the counselors, the domains, the, the forces of hell shall not prevail against it. We need walls, but we need gates. We need counselor that is going to be based on wisdom. We need conduct that is based on sound counselor. We need the wisdom of God. How we can get access to people and how they can have access to us. We don't want open entry. We want to have opportunity. We want to understand how to create proper access. So remember, we are called to be influencers. I want you to hear me today. We cannot influence that which we cannot touch. We need gates. Community transformation comes from addressing community needs in a proactive way. In the book of Nehemiah chapter 2 and in verse number 13, the Bible tells us when Nehemiah went forward, listen carefully to this. The Bible says in verse number 13, and I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate. There are different entrance points and view the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down. And its gates, which were burned with fire. In other words, if you have to create access, you have to view what is happening. I want to put it this way. You must have a clear mind. You must understand the situation. You must have a proper perspective. You must not just be hearing what the news is saying. You mustn't be just hearing what the people are saying. You must have a, a sense of accuracy in determining what you're going to do in your part in building your section because you're not called to be what our brother is doing you're not called to be what our sister is 
having to do. You are listening to me today. And I want you to be an influencer today. And so you must engage your community, but you must understand how to create access. Always remember, even as we have gone through this season where we have had what we call a pandemic, but you notice that through this pandemic, there has been a lot of problems. There has been a lot of adversity. But as we think about all that is happening, we must recognize that there has been a lot of problems, but there has been also a lot of opportunities. Let's understand Gates. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we have to create access. So look for opportunities. Let's rebuild together. Remember this, number five, build relationship with other spheres in the community. We've got to build spheres. We've got to have connection. We have to have communication. Remember this, distress and reproach are issues based on improper relationships. Why would the nation of Israel, why were they in distress and reproach? Remember the Babylonians had moved into their territory. As a consequence also of the Assyrians moving into their territory. There were mixed marriages. There was a mixed multitude. The Samaritans opposed them. And so there was a lot of distress in relationships. As Nehemiah came back to bring revival, one of the things you recognize that there had to be a separation in terms of these mixed marriages. I'm saying all that to say today, as we build relationships with the other spheres, other domains of society, whether the business community, like the churches we call team have been doing with the business and with the police and with the schools and like we have been doing to ourselves, how we have been engaging our communities in doing things in a proactive way, whether we put dustbins on the streets like we have done, whether we have gone into the, tr into the schools and give out books or spectacles like we have been doing, whether we have been feeding the people like we have been doing with our soup kitchen every week of every month of every year. Whatever we have been doing, we have to become engaged in our communities in a very proactive way. We have to continue, in other words, to build relationships. Remember this, as we go forward, we must begin to repair the breaches, relationships. Life is all about relationships. Everything else, my brother, everything else, my sister, is just details. And so we live in the details, but we don't live in the abundance. God is a God of relationships. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, it's God's will that we have a relationship. Marriage is a covenant relationship. Our coming to Christ is a relationship. Our prayer is a relationship. Once you're born into a family, you're born into a relationship. You go to school, you're in a relationship. You go to the job, you're in a relationship. Life is all about relationships. Everything else is just details. And where there is distress, and where there is reproach, it's symptomatic of broken relationships. And so we are called today, we look at the question of family today, and there's a lot of distress and a lot of broken homes. And today, the scriptures has given us the fact that marriage is between a man and a woman. That engagement has been designed for procreation. That design has been designed for continued relationships. That design has been so ordained that we can have the God-ordained institution of marriage and family continuing into perpetuity. But what we see today is an assignment, an engagement by the adversary against marriage. That today, the binary relationship of male and female in marriage is somehow changed so that two men could become a, a couple. It's impossible that two women could become a couple. It's impossible. And that's the situation we are faced with today. And that's why we're called to build walls, to raise the standard, to put value back into marriage, to put value back into family. We must become relevant 
to our society. We can't just look on and say there is distress. We can't just look on and say there is a reproach. We have to raise the standard. We have to raise the standard. We have to create opportunities. We have to speak to those communities. Abortion is in the increase. We have today in the United States in the Supreme Court, Roe versus Wade, a decision that was made way back in 1973, a decision that allowed for abortion to be prevailing in these United States. And today, because there are certain justices in the Supreme Court whose intent is to reverse that ugly and horrible, wicked design against the innocent lives, because there is now an opportunity to reverse that. Information has been leaked. And as though we are back to Sodom and Gomorrah, all across the United States, coming down into Trinidad, there is this protest against the attitude that is the attitude that must be adopted, which is an attitude that says life matters. An attitude that says we believe in pro-life. An attitude that says abortion is murder. We are seeing today, like Sodom and Gomorrah, protests here and protests there, and articles written there, and articles and information everywhere. You have to be informed again, I say. You cannot rise above the level of your information. And if you take the misinformation, you will be deceived. Ignorance is not blessed. Be enlightened today. Understand, a part of your mandate is to rise against the evils of society. We must have values. We must understand when God created, he said it is good. It simply means he has left a standard of right and we must know that what we consider to be right must be in alignment with his word. We cannot just accept what is designed by society and believe that's right. We must understand we have to fight for what is right. We must make a stand. Don't be silent. Go into your communities, raise your voices, use the social media platforms, and let's speak out against the evils of society, the walls of marriage and family, the walls even to protect our children, even from the womb. The womb has now become a tomb. So they want to have even up to the final stages of that conception and birthing process. They want to have that even to be reversed, to say that you can abort a child even while that child is in the last stages of birth. It's a sad day. No wonder Nehemiah mourned. No, mon no wonder he cried. No wonder he stayed in a state of fasting. Our school system, the introduction of comprehensive sexuality education. We must come into the place where we must bring into our school system the revelation of what we call training, an education that is not based on man's design, but it must be based on evidence. It must be evidence-based. It must not just be something that is given based on what we call a group of people who think that it's right. We must know that it's right. We cannot afford to have comprehensive sexual education in our schools, businesses that are corrupt, nations that are in disarray. Where is the hope today? The hope is in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If we have to change, and if we have to change our society, the Bible says in verse 4 of the book of Nehemiah chapter 1, So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept, Lord have mercy, and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I want you to know one of the problems we have in the church and I want us to understand, I love all that's going on in the church. But one of the things I recognize in the church right now, that God is calling his church right now to move into the fields of harvest. Even as we get ready to welcome Jesus Christ back to the earth. This is the season where God has worked. If we go through history and church history, there have been many waves. We have the, the movement called the Catholic movement. For those of you that know church history. The first, second, and third century. By the third and fourth century, we had a decaying. But by the second wave under the Reformation of Martin Luther, we had a mighty move of God. Coming to the early part before the 
turn of the 20th century, we had a great wave of God called the awakening. At the turn of the 20th century, we had what is today called the Pentecostal charismatic movement. In the 1960s and thereafter, we had a movement called the prophetic and the apostolic. Why has God then equipped the saints? Why has God then brought back the fivefold? As we go through these various waves, we can see God res restoring the pastoral, the teachers. In the awakening, there was a great move of the evangelist. And then we see the apostolic and the prophetic. Why? Because it's the season now of the equipping of the saints. This is the season of the saints' movements. That's what we talk about when we talk about Pentecost. It is the saints' movement. We now receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Go out there with the gifts, healings, miracles, signs, wonders, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, transforming communities. People are looking for answers. The answer is within you. There are gifts given to you. And the gift is, yes, to be a minister to the body, but to be a missionary to your community. You have to go out there and make the difference in society today. And how you do that is by changing beliefs into values. Convert your beliefs into values. We believe that Jesus is the answer. You know, when I look into the early church, they had what we call values. Because the Bible says they continued steadfastly. How did they continue? Consistently. There was commitment to what they believed. That's what values are. You can have a value, like I said, on something. You know, the, you have a belief. But the Bible says the devil, the devils believe and they tremble. You can have beliefs. It's only mental. But values go beyond the mental. It changes the heart. Hallelujah. You see, that's what we have. We believe that Jesus is the way. But has that become a value? We believe that Jesus is the truth. Has that become a value? We believe that Jesus is the life. Has that become a value? We must convert our beliefs into values. And it's only done by commitment to what you believe. You cannot say that I believe that Jesus heals and don't acknowledge healing in your life. And ministry. I cannot say that Jesus brings deliverance and not go forth and bring people to deliverance. We have to convert our beliefs into values. Beliefs give mental assent. Values change behavior. Listen to this. Concern without action is like impression without expression. We could be concerned about our communities but have no action. Remember this, the Bible says faith without works is dead. <laughs> faith without works is dead. Now as we convert our beliefs into values, number eight, you must seek the favor of God. The Bible tells us, and we don't have time to go into the details of Nehemiah's prayer. But if we have another opportunity to go into the details, I'll tell you, the dimensions of his prayer. He had a dimension, we call it intercession, because he was praying for the people. He had a dimension he called, we call it, uh, where he actually was repenting. But his repentance was not just for himself. It was identification repentance. He identified with the sins of the people. When you want to bring change as we build together, you have to identify with what's going on and the sins of this community. The sins of that community. What is wrong with the community? How did it get to be so? And what could be done about it? One way to deal with that is to have identification repentance. Repent on behalf of the abortions. Repent on behalf of all the gang violence. Repent on behalf of all the drug addiction. Repent on behalf of all the abuse, of all the alcoholism that you may see in that community before you go into bringing any transformation identification repentance and he had petition he prayed even for himself that he will have favor with the king are you listening to me so favor is important because favor from god is always for his assignment when we pray identification repentance when we pray intercession 
or intercessory prayer. When we pray in the will of God, God gives us favor. And favor is always for his assignment. Wherever God's assignment is, and you find yourself in the will of God, you will find yourself in the favor of God. Favor is always for the assignment. Number nine, expect the favor of men when you are in God's assignment. So after he had prayed in chapter one, and I want to just look at one part of his prayer. In verse 11 of chapter one, he said, Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant them mercy in the sight of this man. Who is this man? He was the king. Because, as you know, Nehemiah was a cupbearer of the king. And so he got favor. He got favor from the king. In chapter 2, we read from verse 6 to verse number 8. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me. And I set him a time. You know, he could answer this way because he had a vision. He had a sense of the future as he walked through that place. As he looked at the walls, he already had a plan in his mind. And he understood the future. What is a vision? A vision is simply an, a sight into a preferable future that you will live in. And the only future that you were living is the one you designed for yourself. Look at Nehemiah. There was a yesterday and there was a today. And so you could have a tomorrow. What you do today is what you're going to reap tomorrow. The future of your success as we build together, as we plan together, as we pray together, as we repair the walls together, as we refurbish the gates. Remember, the only future you will live in is the one you prepare for yourself. And never forget, never ever forget, the secret of your success is in your daily routine. What did Nehemiah do? He didn't sit down and pray alone. He put legs to his prayer. He got up, he had a plan, and he reviewed the walls. He now turned his plan into a vision. And his vision was governed by values. Values are like government. Values are those things that govern you. Values are those things that make your vision relevant. We can have a vision for this community, but until we have values, we will have broken down walls and burned gates. Expect the favor of men. But look at how he had the favor of men, simply because he was in the favor of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we read again chapter 2, verse 6, and I read, the Bible says, Then the king said to me, How long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. That's vision. The vision is always for an appointed time. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And letters to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel which pertains to the temple. All of you in this house understand what we did recently as we wanted to do something in this community in terms of rebuilding a building. How many know we could not do it without the favor of men? Hallelujah. You will have governmental, governmental favor. He had favor with the governors. You will have favor with builders. You will have favor even with the hardware stores sometimes. You will have favor with the business community. Get in the will of God. And you will find that the things that seem to be a mountain will no longer become a monument, but will become a possibility. What becomes possible will also become probable because God is in it. And if God is in your dreams, he can make it into a reality. We must turn and understand who we are serving today. Seek the favor of God, but expect the favor of men when you are on God's assignment. He will cause to be released all that is necessary for the assignment. 
You thought we had a good worship and it, we did. That was a big shock. But you have a bigger shock coming. What God is yet to do, you haven't seen anything yet. You have to understand that anointings come in seasons to bring us to new dimensions of His glory. There is a harvesting anointing that God has released. We have to step into that anointing. If we miss this season, we will miss the opportunity of a lifetime. Understand how God works. He always works through seasons. Our preaching and teaching must be consistent with the seasons that we are in. And if we understand seasons, we will understand how to step into that season. Hallelujah. You don't trouble the waters, but when the waters are troubled, you step in. Remember, we were created to be diverse, but not divided. And the Lord told them, and I told them, sorry, verse 18, of my God, which had been good upon me, the hand of God, and also of the king's word, the hand of God, the king's word, that he had spoken to me. Listen to verse 18 as we continue. So they said, now the turn has come. What could not be done in over 15 years? The Bible tells us, as he had a testimony of the goodness of God, there was repentance. <laughs> let us rise up. So they said, let us rise up. So they said, let us rise up and build. And what did they do? They set their hands to this good work. It was not just their heads. It was not just their hearts. It was now their hands. What is in our minds to do cannot be done until it becomes a part of our heart. And what is in our heart to do cannot become effective until we put our hands to the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so we must do it together. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs>